Okay, everyone. So welcome again um, to our final presentation for the Heart Smarts February Heart Month Ask the Doctor Community Education Series. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Dr. Nasolo Teddy. I am the creator and director of the Heart Smarts program. Thank you all for joining us this evening and thank you again for your patience. Um, tonight's uh, presentation is brought to you in partnership with Plant Powered Metro New York. And we thank all of you who are joining us um, from that organization as well. Um, before we move on to the actual program, um, I just want to share a few words. Um, tonight's program is dedicated to one of our Heart Smarts ambassadors that we lost in January, um, Ambassador Claudette Singleton, who represents Brooklyn, New York. Um, she passed away um, unexpectedly. And so um, we dedicate tonight's program and the whole February Heart Month series to her. Um, ambassador Singleton was one of our original Heart Smarts ambassadors. She started with me in 2012. And you can see these throwback photographs of us um, in 2011, 2012, with all of you who are, some of you who are here tonight, um, Sister Herbert, Reverend Barrett, uh, Sister Alexis, and um, those of you who I may have missed, uh, Wilbur Johnson is also on the line. So the original Heart Smarts crew, um, we salute Ambassador Claudette Singleton and she will be dearly missed. Um, also, I just wanna thank you all for um, supporting this February Heart Month series. We've had some amazing presenters, starting with Dr. Ravella, Chef Babette, Dr. Baptiste, uh, Dr. Ross, and Dr. Anderson and Dr. Krieger last week. And we are closing it out this evening with the amazing um, Dr. Mills. And so I will just read Dr. Mills' um, bio, um, short bio. Um, Dr. Milton Mills practices urgent care medicine in the Washington, D.C. area and has served previously as Associate Director of Preventive Medicine and as a member of the National Advisory Board for Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. He has been a major contributor to position papers presented by PCRM to the, the, to the United States Department of Agriculture regarding dietary guidelines for Americans and has been the lead plaintiff in PCRM's class action lawsuit that asked for warning labels on milk. Dr. Mills earned his medical degree at Stanford University School of Medicine and completed an internal medicine residency at Georgetown University Hospital. He has published several research journal articles dealing with racial bias in federal nutrition policy. He frequently donates his time via practicing at free medical clinics and travels widely, speaking at hospitals, churches, and community centers throughout the country. He was featured in the recent attention getting film, What the Health, and will also appear in the upcoming film, The Silent Vegan. Um, so before we welcome Dr. Mills, I just wanna tell you all to please stay on the meeting um, after we finish um, with Dr. Mills' presentation and the q and I have some quick announcements um, regarding next steps and um, additional programming for March and beyond uh, for HeartSmart. So if you're interested in that, please stay on um, the meeting after um, Dr. Mills is done. And so Dr. Mills, I am going to spotlight you and turn it over to you. And the format that we have for the um, Ask the Doctor series um, oops, uh, is um, uh, that you will present and then um, uh, there will be questions asked in the chat and I will um, filter those questions and ask them to you and you can answer them. Um, and then you can let me know um, when you need to stop um, since we're starting, I guess, around 7.30. So you can let me know um, when the stop time would be for you. 7.30 Eastern time. Um, so you can let me know when the stop time would be for you. So Dr. Mills, you are on. Oh, okay. So first of all, let me say that um, since it was kind of my um, uh, 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 snafu that we're starting late, I am perfectly willing to go past um, um, the the uh, um, usual time to make up for for getting started late, and um, that's not a problem for me. Um, but I am happy to be here, and I do thank you for inviting me. Um, and um, I'm not sure what the uh, previous uh, pr presenters this month have talked about with respect to um, uh, plant-based diets and um, our heart disease, but um, my um, uh, place within the plant-based movement is that I try to help people understand that the reason plant-based diets are so effective for um, us as human beings in terms of um, helping to prevent disease, chronic disease, and even reverse 
these diseases if we um, are able to um, uh, adopt a plant-based diet and, and adhere to it is because we are naturally um, a plant-based species. Most, uh, most of us have been taught growing up that human beings are omnivores, that we are supposed to be eating a combination of plant based foods and animal foods. And, and that simply is not true. That when um, we look at um, uh, human anatomy and physiology, uh, when we look at our disease susceptibilities, uh, it's very clear that we are uh, adapted to a strictly plant-based diet. And when we adhere to that plant-based diet, it promotes the best overall health, um, and longevity, um, as well as, um, again, uh, gives us the lowest risk for disease and dementia. And uh, even in uh, extreme cases, can actually reverse the blockages that we see building up in um, the arteries of people who have been eating um, uh, animal-based foods. And what one of the things that's very fascinating is um, uh, an associate of mine has recently presented a, a couple of online uh, presentations looking at the differences in the ways that um, fat and cholesterol are handled between um, uh, uh, animals that are meat eaters versus those that are typical uh, plant eaters. And this is um, data that's been known for actually well over 50 years. Uh, back in the 1950s, when uh, researchers were beginning to do um, um, the medical research to try and look at the origins of heart disease in humans, uh, they started looking for animal models to use. And initially they were using dogs. But what they found is that no matter how much fat, saturated fat and cholesterol they fed the dogs, the dogs would never ever develop blockages in any of their arteries, including their heart arteries, unless they took out the um, dog's thyroid gland. They actually had to make them hypothyroid in order for them to develop um, cardiac lesions. And this is because <clears throat> as carnivores, dogs have um, uh, what's called a, uh, a lipoprotein metabolism, meaning their livers are so good at processing fat and cholesterol that it never um, uh, uh, essentially remains in their bloodstream long enough to start to um, injure their blood uh, uh, vessels and uh, begin the process of, of blocking them. But if conversely, you feed that same type of diet to a typical plant-based animal like a rabbit or even um, um, rodents like rats, they very quickly began to develop um, cardiac lesions and blockages just as humans do. And again, this is because we do not have the ability to process uh, large amounts of fat and cholesterol. And um, um, I, I must, I'm going to assume that by this point, most of your listeners already know that um, we have no need for um, cholesterol in our diet at all because we make all of the cholesterol that uh, we need to remain healthy um, and that any cholesterol that we take in in our diet is um, uh, uh, in addition to what we already make and therefore um, um, tends to um, uh, create uh, problems and and uh, causes um, a, a difficulty with our bodies processing this excess cholesterol and, and disposing of it. So <clears throat> again, it, it's uh, it, it's very very clear from um, uh, you know direct um, uh, lab based research from epidemiologic studies and from population-based observational studies. And some of the, again, some of the very interesting ones uh, that were done were observational studies that were done uh, during the uh, war years in World War II. 
so there were countries like Denmark um, uh, and uh, um, Finland where they had traditionally eaten a diet that was very heavy in uh, high cholesterol foods, uh, meat, uh, uh, high fat dairy products, cheese, and, and had a very high baseline rate of um, uh, heart disease in these populations. But uh, uh, during the late 1930s and through the mid 1940s, uh, when the uh, Germans had essentially taken over that part of Europe, taken over their countries, and were shipping all of the so-called best foods out of the country. So they would they took all of the beef, the the uh, 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 cheeses, and 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 the cream, and the rich foods, and essentially forced the uh, population to live on what was a de facto uh, more plant-based diet and a very low fat diet, what um, was observed uh, within the country was that the rates of heart disease and heart attacks plummeted and um, were uh, at a very low level during the period of the German occupation. But once the war ended, and people went back to eating the traditional Nordic diet with its you know, high uh, animal food and high saturated fat content, the uh, rates of heart disease, again, steeply increased and went back to baseline. So once again, we saw a very direct correlation between um, what people were eating and uh, the diseases that they developed. Um, and uh, the sort of uh, flip side of that coin are the studies that were done by um, Dr. Ornish at um, University of California in San Francisco and uh, Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn at the Cleveland Clinic um, that showed that by taking people with uh, demonstrated uh, heart disease, putting them on a low fat plant-based diet excluding all animal foods, that even without medications, you could get reversal of heart disease. And I, I'd like to show one example of that to, to your listeners. So I'm going to hit the share screen. Okay. Um, and let me, let's see, let me bring this up. Um, uh, okay, can you, can you, I think you guys can see this slide. This is benefits of a plant-based diet, correct? Yes. Okay, all right, great. And uh, all right. So this doctor um, is um, uh, Dr. Joseph Crow. He was a actually a cardiovascular surgeon. Um, at the uh, Cleveland Clinic in uh, the uh, 90s, uh, who performed bypasses on um, other patients. Um, but he himself uh, developed heart disease and began having uh, chest pains that were associated with uh, um, um, probable heart disease um, around uh, April of 1996, the pains gradually uh, got, became more frequent and more intense. And then finally, in November of 1996, he had a severe and major heart attack that caused him to be rushed to the cardiac cath lab, uh, which is where uh, people who are having um, uh, acute active um, heart attacks are taken so that um, uh, you can try and open up the blocked artery. Um, his blockage was so severe that he um, uh, coded twice uh, during the uh, catheterization procedure and had to be um, revived with uh, shocks and uh, CPR. Um, unfortunately, um, or, or fortunately for him, depending on how you see the, the, uh, how this played out, what the catheterization showed was that the blockage in his artery was in one of the most important arteries for cardiac function, the, what's called the LAD or left anterior descending artery. That is the artery that passes down the front of the main pumping chamber of the heart. 
but the blockage was so far down the um, artery and it was a long and what's kind of called ragged um, uh, blockage that they couldn't reach it with a wire stent, but it was also in a place where they really couldn't put a bypass uh, graft on. And so when he, and I'm gonna show you pictures of this in a minute. And so when he uh, came, woke up from recovery, the doctors explained this to him and uh, told him that what that meant was they would simply have to, uh, quote, medically manage him from that po point forward. And um, to most non-medical people, when they're told, well, we're going to medically manage you, it, it sounds like that means that we're going to give you medications to treat this problem uh, as opposed to surgically intervening. But what it really means is we're going to give you medicines to mask the pain and symptoms um, until you eventually pass away. Um, that's really what medical management means in, in this situation. So um, he was really um, very depressed about this. Uh, but then he talked to his colleague, uh, Dr. Esselstyn, who was also at the Cleveland Clinic and who had been treating people with um, lifestyle interventions. And uh, Dr. Esselstyn put him on um, the plant-based diet without medications. And within uh, two and a half years, the blockages in his arteries had completely reversed. So let me show you those pictures. So, all right, on the left, you see the uh, original um, lesion in the LAD. You see how long and, and, and uh, constricted it was and that it just um, did not lend itself to being either bypassed or having a stent put in. But then over uh, on the right side of the screen, we see that... Uh, Two and a half years later, um, after being on the, um, again, plant-based diet without any statins or other medications and just uh, low fat uh, or no added fat uh, plant foods, um, the lesion, the blockages had completely regressed. And so it is possible to reverse uh, heart disease uh, with diet alone. And um, these and other instances of reversing heart disease are detailed in Dr. Esselstyn's book, uh, Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease by Caldwell Esselstyn. And uh, I uh, um, recommend this book to anyone who is either challenged with heart disease or knows someone who um, might be challenged by this disease. And um, this would also be useful for someone who had blockages uh, associated with um, uh, their cerebral vascular circula circulation that could be causing strokes or mini strokes and or um, blockages in their limbs uh, that might be causing a problem called claudication, where when people go walking, um, they might find that after they walk for a block or two, they suddenly get, suddenly get these, these uh, uh, extreme cramping pains in their legs that prevent them from uh, continuing to walk. And those are generally due uh, to, uh, again, blockages in the large arteries supplying blood to the legs. So um, the bottom line is that by changing our diet, we absolutely can change uh, um, our coronary circulation, reverse these blockages in our uh, our hearts uh, and uh, and other organs, and uh, and restore our body to health. So let me come to this. Let's see. I'll stop share. All right. Um, so. Um, I, you know, with that, um, um, were there any other, uh, I mean, before I start, we start the Q and A, um, um, uh, were there any other specific topics, um, uh, uh, you, uh, would like for me to cover with respect to, uh, diet and heart disease? 
Um, yes, Dr. Mills, we cannot have you here without you not talking about dairy, right? Oh. <laughs> Oh, oh my God. Yeah. Although um, it's like, how many days uh, do you guys have? You um, said we have you forever. So no, go ahead. Yeah, no, 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 no. I, I'm just, I, um, no, dairy, dairy is, 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 is a, a just a critically uh, important topic. And um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about um, my, um, um, dairy lecture and i'm just trying i, I want to think um of of um just you know there's so much information that um uh, uh i can talk about so tell you what uh i'm gonna bring this lecture up and then we'll just kind of selectively go through uh some slides and talk about some of the more interesting points. How about that? Okay, so um, first I have to do share screen. Share. All right. So now you see um, my grid, my slide, my uh, slide grid. Correct. Yes. All right. Fantastic. So. Um, before I actually uh, uh, start on this, uh, I want to make a couple points, and that is, um, uh, I am currently working on um, finalizing a lecture that uh, is going to be titled "Decolonize Your Diet," and um, the point of that lecture is to help people understand that. Much of what we eat in Western countries, particularly when it comes to people of color, are foods that were imposed, foods and dietary habits and ways of eating that were imposed upon us through the process of colonization. Um, I, I would just kind of ask um, for the people that I can see on, 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 on my screen, how many of you have eaten Ethiopian food? Can I just kind of show, show, show your hand? Show your hand up if you've had Ethiopian uh, Ethiopian meal at an Ethiopian restaurant? Or you Nobody? can type it in the chat. You can put it in the chat as well, yes or no, if you have. Well, I, um, okay. Oh, okay. I see some hands going up. All right, great. Um, and you know that when you have, when you go to an Ethiopian restaurant, you are given this essentially huge platter of a variety of different plant foods. And uh, then you're given bread that you use to sample the different uh, um, options that are available to you. Um, and, and most uh, um, uh, traditional ethnic, ethnic cuisines are typically built around um, whole Unpressed, unprocessed plant foods that um, uh, uh, contain, you know, minimal amounts of animal tissue or animal flesh, if any, and no dairy. Uh, so, you know, uh, dairy products were not a part of West African uh, uh, cuisine traditionally. They were not a part of uh, uh, Native American uh, traditional cuisine. They were not a part of uh, the um, North and South American uh, indigenous uh, uh, um, uh, people's uh, uh, cuisines. Uh, these uh, uh, products were um, uh, made um, um, a part of, of uh, the food culture after colonization, but even even more importantly, uh, in uh, um, more equatorial regions, um, where plant foods um, um, grow much more easily and profusely, um, uh, plants tended to make up the bulk of what people ate. Whereas, as you move into more northerly uh, temperate climates where plant foods are less available year round, 
uh, people began to rely more heavily on animal foods. And that is one of the reasons that uh, the process of dairying or using uh, the milk of uh, other mammals uh, became a practice somewhere between between three to 5,000 years ago in Northern European countries um, uh, because they found that they were able to use the calories from uh, uh, the uh, uh, milk to create foods to sustain them throughout the wintertime. Moreover, um, in, um, again, European cultures, the uh, wealthy uh, individuals um, reserved uh, large animals uh, for themselves. Uh, in uh, medieval England, you could literally be put to death for, quote, killing the king's deer. So the, this idea of making um, a dead animal carcass the centerpiece of your meal, again, is a very European style of eating. Um, uh, and um, whereas in, again, most uh, um, uh, traditional ethnic um, um, modes and styles of eating, um, animal foods play a much smaller role and part in providing uh, the calories uh, um, um, for people. And uh, as a result, what we see is that um, when it comes to, you know, something as simple and obvious as lactose intolerance, that is the ability to um, digest uh, the sugar that's in milk, which is lactose, Around the world, 65 to 70% 70, 70 of the people on earth are lactose intolerant as adults. They lose the ability to digest milk once they become adults. The only populations where it remains um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, a, a uh, uh, where, where the adults, I, I can't, um, I just, well, I'll say retain the ability to continue to ingest and digest uh, um, uh, uh, dairy foods without difficulty throughout their lifetimes are in populations that either come from Northern European uh, locales or have, for various reasons, had the penetrance of northern european genes into their gene pool and um the but uh, um what's important is that this ability to digest lactose is um a mutation that was reattained um so um um what what genetic studies show is that the, that the populations that uh, um, uh, European populations that are able to continue to digest uh, lactose throughout their lifetimes, they at some point over the last 5,000 years reattained the ability to um, continue digesting lactose. And because that ability did confer a um, uh, survival advantage on those individuals who were able to um, digest these dairy foods, that became much more prevalent within the population because those individuals were more likely to survive, have descendants, and, and so forth. Uh, but within the United States, for instance, we see that 70, somewhere between 73 to 90 plus percent of African Americans are lactose intolerant. Um, this is interesting because that is... Um, vis-a-vis uh, -vis 90 to 95% of native West Africans are lactose intolerant. And so you might ask, why is there a larger percentage of African-Americans who are um, uh, less lactose intolerant than, than uh, West Africans? Well, it's the same reason we have a lot of light-skinned African-Americans. It's because so many black women were raped during slavery. 
And so you have the penetrance of European genes into the African-American gene pool that you do not have in native West African populations. So uh, their genes are not as admixed with European genes. And that's why they are uh, um, essentially, uh, if you will, more of a wild type. Uh, among Asian populations, again, because there's much less uh, in, uh, been less intermixing uh, with uh, European populations, 90 to 95% of Native American, I mean, I'm sorry, Asian populations are lactose intolerant. Uh, amongst Native Americans, it's uh, 74 to uh, 90 plus percent. And amongst Hispanic Americans, it is uh, 50 three to uh, and some groups as high as 90%. And again, um, that uh, reflects the um, influence of Spanish, uh, um, uh, the Spanish gene pool being uh, 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 mixed in with uh, native Hispanic people. So, uh, but, the, but the bottom line is the vast majority of people of color in the United States um, are lactose intolerance and will experience um, uh, um, severe gastrointestinal distress when consuming lactose-containing dairy foods. But what's even more important than that is that the um, uh, growth proteins in dairy foods uh, um, have a, a high propensity to cause um, uh, dairy protein allergy in uh, people of color, um, and also to cause um, growth-related diseases, such as um, when you look at the rates of prostate cancer in Black men, um, Black men have 70% uh, higher prevalence of prostate cancer than Caucasian men, and even worse, when we are diagnosed with prostate cancer, we are more than twice as likely to die from it because we get much more aggressive um, and anaplastic forms of the disease, meaning that these that when a black man has prostate cancer, it tends to metastasize much earlier uh, uh, and spread more aggressively, and it kills us uh, um, much more frequently. Uh, the uh, number one risk factor for uh, developing prostate cancer is consumption of dairy of dairy foods um, uh, because of the um, uh, proteins and the hormones that are in uh, um, cow's milk and cheese. Um, but uh, um, African American women also have a higher uh, risk um, and rate of mortality rate from breast cancer. Um, and again, studies have shown a direct correlation between milk consumption and increased risk for breast cancer. And again, uh, it's because of uh, these, not only growth uh, proteins, but also the um, uh, um, uh, hormone levels in, in, in these, uh, um, uh, in, in the milk. Um, so let me, let me go back and I, I wanna show you guys uh, something about, about these um, uh, uh, growth proteins. So, Let's see, let me bring this up here. Um, so this, this, I just wanna show um, the differences between um, um, human breast milk and um, cow's milk. Um, um, that uh, cow's milk um, has, um, uh, uh, let's see. Um, Cow's milk has a lot more protein and uh, a lot more um, uh, a lot more saturated fat um, than uh, 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 a human breast milk. Human breast milk actually is very low protein, and um, that's not a bad thing because protein is used for growth. And human babies are the slowest growing mammals on the planet, and so our babies don't need a lot of protein. Uh, protein uh, um, stimulates uh, cancer growth, quite frankly, because a protein is a signal to cells to grow. And if those cells aren't supposed to be growing, 
they tend to grow in ways that are abnormal. Um, uh, let's see, uh, this, okay. So um, cow's milk has more than uh, almost five times more protein per kilocalorie. Um, the casein to weight ratio is completely opposite, as you can see from this graph. And um, cow's milk has seven times more casein uh, than human milk, which has more whey protein. And again, um, this has a uh, an adverse effect on a child's physiology by stimulating uh, genes that are more likely to cause uh, a human baby to become obese, uh, be more susceptible to things like diabetes, uh, uh, and uh, other uh, health problems as a, as the child grows. And then um, what's really interesting is that even though uh, human um, uh, human uh, um, uh, and cows milk have similar amounts of fat, total amounts of fat, the type of fat in cow's milk and human milk are, are very different. Um, I, I see a lot of, of women on this 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 um, presentation, and um, um, most of you have know what human breast milk looks like. It has a uh, translucent quality to it versus what whole cow's milk look like looks like. It has a very opaque white uh, appearance, and that's because most uh, much of the fat that is in cow's milk is saturated fat, which is why you can churn butter uh, from cow's milk and you can make ice cream from cow's milk, but you cannot churn, make churn butter from human breast milk nor make ice cream from it. And that's because most of the fat that's in human breast milk is unsaturated fat um, as opposed to saturated fats. And again, this will have a very different effect on our physiology when it's fed uh, uh, to us. Um, and... Um, the uh, other other really important point is that uh, human breast milk has a lot of what are called um, oligosaccharides, um, which are these uh, a form of carbohydrate, which are important for helping uh, a, a baby's microbiome start to grow and uh, um, uh, uh, get us get well established. And because uh, cow's milk doesn't have these oligosaccharides, um, uh, uh, children that are fed cow's milk don't have as healthy a microbiome as uh, um, uh, babies fed uh, their mother's breast milk. And uh, I already talked about the differences in um, the uh, unsaturated fats uh, and mono uh, unsaturated fats with human breast milk versus a saturated fats uh, in cow's milk, which are much higher. Uh, and this is something that I just think is really, really important because over on the right, um, you see a, a graph that shows the weight of a fetus um, uh, um, based on whether or not the mother drinks milk during her pregnancy. And the bottom line is this. Women who drink milk while they're pregnant because of these growth stimulatory proteins in the cow's milk tend to have much larger babies. The problem with that, because, you know, again, unfortunately, we have been taught to think that, oh, bigger is better. And if you have a great big baby, that, that means that that baby is healthy. Number one, that's not true. But what is especially problematic is that larger babies cause much more trauma to the mother's birth canal. Women who are having these large cow's milk driven babies tend to have um, more uh, vaginal tears, more fistulas, more lifelong problems with um, uh, um, urinary incontinence and painful intercourse uh, because of the trauma inflicted on their birth canals from these um, uh, overly large babies. So not only is the cow's milk not good for the baby, it's not good for the mother. And we really need to uh, uh, reconsider what we're feeding ourselves and our kids. Um, remember, uh, a, a calf is born, uh, when a calf is born, it weighs about 60 to 80 pounds. 
by its third birthday, it weighs at um, somewhere between six to 800 pounds. That's how fast these animals grow. So that's why there's so much protein in cow's milk, but the protein that's in the milk also is very growth stimulatory. Um, whereas human milk, again, very low protein, and the protein is designed not to make the baby grow fast because ba our babies have 18 years to reach adulthood. They don't need to grow fast. Um, um, but when they do, it tends to cause... Um, uh, uh, more health problems. Uh, and it causes health problems early on in life, but it also causes, puts them at higher risk for developing uh, cancers like colon cancer, uh, uh, breast cancer, and, and uh, accelerated uh, aging and so forth. And again, you know, we could, like I said, we can talk all day uh, about these things, um, um, but I just, I just have to... Um, uh, um, kind of move very quickly. Now, some people might say, wait a minute, does that mean that plant-based kids are going to end up not being as healthy or as, as, as big as uh, or reach their normal height? And the answer is no, because although children who are raised on a plant-based diet grow more slowly, the studies show that they end up being as tall or even taller than children who are raised on animal foods, ultimately, uh, but that they just reach that size at a uh, somewhat later uh, age, but that that translates into improved overall health throughout their lifetime and uh, increased uh, longevity. All right, so let's see, let me, where do I want to skip to now um uh this let me just uh show uh this information on um this was just the data on uh lactose intolerance in populations around the world and again you see that uh within um places with uh um uh predominantly uh populations of color uh, the prevalence of lactose intolerance is extremely high, um, uh, but in the most uh, uh, the populations with the lowest prevalence of lactose intolerance are uh, the uh, populations where predominantly uh, people of European descent uh, uh, live. Um, For some reason, my computer has stopped responding. Okay, there we go. Um, oh, and it's this is just. Uh, to show that if uh, that again, seventy five percent of people of color on average have lactose intolerance. This is why uh, you have a black person, Asian, Native American, and Hispanic who are all desperately trying to get into uh, the bathroom after having drink drank a glass of milk. Uh, symptoms uh, uh, include um, bloating, cramping, gas, diarrhea, nausea. Uh, this is uh, an issue um, for school children because school children participating in the National School Lunch Program are required by law to receive um, uh, one or two cartons of milk on their lunch tray every single day. And I believe that this may help explain part of the uh, achievement gap that we see in children of color relative to their white counterparts because um, the children of color after being forced to ingest this milk will be sick um, uh, and either distracted by their symptoms or running back and forth to the bathroom while the their white counterparts are able to focus uh, on their studies with uh, little or no difficulty. Um, and so, you know, people say, well, what about the nutrients? Well, number one, um, what's called vitamin D is not naturally found in milk or other dairy products. 
it was added to dairy by the dairy industry and called vitamin D to entice people into um, purchasing their products. Um, we would normally make um, D3 by sun exposure, but because we live indoors and wear clothes and we're outside, we most of us don't get adequate sun exposure. That's why I recommend to everyone that we take a D3 supplement, 5,000 I use every day. You don't need dairy uh, foods to get it. It's plenty of phosphorus, magnesium, calcium, uh, and zinc in plant foods. And of course, we should stay away from animal protein because it does promote um, development of disease. So my motto is drinking milk for its nutrients is like inhaling cigarette smoke for oxygen. Not a good idea. Um, let's see. I think those are probably um, the, the, uh, uh, the most important points I wanna make about dairy. Um, so we'll stop share right now and, uh, <laughs> and go back any, any other, any other major points you want me to touch on? There's a long list. So the next one is sugar. And so, um, you can just take that where you want, or, um, there are some people in the meeting who are trying to stop sugar altogether and they need you to say something that's going to get them to fully invest in that um, commitment that they want to make to that. Okay. Glad <laughs> you asked. <laughs> uh, as they say, there's an app for that. Um, let's see. Let me, let's, let's talk about sugar a little bit. Um, Well, my sugar slide is right next to my alcohol slide. So I am, and this comes from my lecture on um, diet and cancer. So let me hit share, um, bring this up. All right, so uh, I'm gonna, I just wanna briefly touch on um, alcohol. Oops, nope, no, no, that's the wrong side. Forgive me for that. Um, this is what I want. Uh, because uh, I don't think um, we uh, often understand the, the dangers associated with alcohol. And so number one, we gotta be really clear about alcohol. And that is that alcohol causes cancer. And that's just a fact. Um, now, um, uh, the question is how much alcohol um, a person ex is exposed to, okay? Um, the link between alcohol and cancer has been known for over 100 years and increases cancers of the oral cavity, pharynx, liver, bladder, larynx, colorectal cancer, breast, pancreas, prostate, and can also increase melanoma in susceptible populations. Um, worldwide, 5.8% of all cancer deaths have been linked to alcohol. And this is where it gets interesting. In men, as you can see from this graph that just came up on the left, most alcohol-related cancers are head and neck cancers, cancers of the mouth and pharynx, um, and esophageal cancers, uh, GI cancers. But in women, cancers that are related to alcohol primarily show up in the breast. And that's why it's really, really important for us to um, educate our daughters and, you know, nieces, um, and ourselves, wives, whatever, about being judicious with the consumption of alcohol, because this is a major contributor to breast cancer risk in women. Um, and so, uh, it has been shown that it increases the risk for uh, cancer death in a linear fashion, meaning that the more a person drinks, the, the greater the risk. So, and, and the reason I'm stressing this is I'm not saying that if you go to a wedding and have a couple of glasses of champagne, that, oh my God, you're going to die of cancer. No, but I don't think it's a good idea to habitually 
have a couple of cocktails every day or even, you know, three or four times a week. I think that that alcohol intake at that level does start to increase one's risk for cancer. Um, now, uh, fiber-rich diet has been shown to somewhat ameliorate the um, alcohol-related cancer risk. And current recommendations are that uh, men should have less than three drinks per day and women should have the equivalent of less than two drinks per day. And some people would say that that's pushing the limit. So um, I really just wanna get that information out there so that we can be aware of it and be very, very cautious about uh, how much alcohol we're taking in. Um, and uh, this is a very good um, uh, video to watch. Um, this can be found on YouTube, uh, Dr. Dr. Gregor's nutritionfacts.org. It's free. Just go to YouTube, type in nutritionfacts.org, and you can pull up uh, his uh, video on, is it better to drink a little alcohol or none at all? Uh, because uh, one of the things that people always wonder, they say, well, I, you know, I thought that um, um, red wine was good for our heart. Well, it turns out the things that are in red wine that are actually good for your heart are the things that make the wine red, the uh, uh, the flavanols. But you can find those compounds in, you know, grapes and uh, berries and uh, brightly colored fruits and vegetables. You don't need the wine uh, to do that. And you certainly don't need the alcohol component uh, for the benefit. Otherwise, drinking a beer would be good for your heart, which we know it isn't. All right. So let's talk about refined carbohydrates because that's really what people mean when they say sugar. Um, because um, all carbohydrates are eventually broken down into glucose, which is a simple sugar. Um, and uh, when you eat plant foods in their natural state, the starch, which is starch, uh, um, is just multiple uh, uh, units, sugar units that are connected to one another. But the starch is always protected by fiber, plant fiber. And that blocks and, sl and slows that, blocks enzymes and really slows down the uh, uh, digestion and breakdown of the sugar so that it's absorbed into our system in a much more gradual fashion and has um, what's called a better glycemic index. In addition, because there are um, uh, uh, vitamins, minerals, and antioxidants that are, oh, excuse me, attached to um, the fiber, um, you are not getting just pure glucose, you're getting glucose in association with a number of important nutrients. So that is one another reason why um, we, when plant-based diets are recommended, the term that's usually used is a whole food plant-based diet, meaning that you're eating the whole plant in as natural a state as possible so that you're getting that fiber and those nutrients that normally would come uh, uh, with, with that starch. Refined sugars are processed carbohydrates, meaning that the um, plant has been processed to purify the sugar component out of it and remove the uh, fiber component um, and that, um, unfortunately, um, uh, can, in some respects, uh, uh, increase uh, can cancer risk um, uh, to some extent, because it turns out, what? excuse me, that some cancer cells um, have um, modifications that uh, allow them to use um, refined carbohydrates preferentially for their metabolism. Um, um, we also know that um, refined sugars tend to deplete our body of a number of important vitamins and, 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 and nutrients. And generally, um, uh, 
increase the level of inflammation in the body, which will also drive a number of other disease uh, processes. So indirect effects of uh, processed carbohydrates are mediated also through increased insulin levels, which will cause uh, help uh, increase insulin resistance, which can make you uh, more prone to becoming uh, uh, developing type 2 diabetes. Or if you're already a type 2 diabetic, it will make you uh, make it more difficult to control your uh, blood sugar level. Um, and uh, um, high insulin levels also make your body much more uh, prone to store fat, um, uh, which large, when the more adipose tissue we have in our body, um, the more um, stress hormones we have circulating, which increases total body in inflammation. And again, tends to uh, switch on uh, the type of genes that um, uh, promote chronic disease. Um, and again, processed carbohydrates can directly affect some cancer cells because of this mutation that I mentioned before that causes them to preferentially take up and utilize those simple car carbohydrates. So uh, it has been uh, um, theorized that when people consume a lot of processed carbs, that um, uh, uh, if they have the, a cancer already developing, that eating a lot of processed carbs can actually augment the growth of uh, of those tumors. So um, th this, I have to apologize because I'm not sure. Okay. Um, uh, this is just to show you um, the amount of sugar in some very common drinks. Um, uh, as you can see, uh, um, uh, these these uh, very, very commonly consumed uh, beverages are just full of processed sugar. Um, and uh, um, one way to try and wean oneself off of soda is not to go to diet soda, because again, other studies have shown that um, diet soda tends to actually um, uh, increase the craving for sugar, number one. But more importantly, um, the um, artificial sweeteners in um, um, diet soda may themselves um, uh, um, create problems. So for instance, aspartame or NutraSweet um, can create a form of mal formaldehyde in the body that over time um, can uh, contribute to uh, cancer risk on its own. Um, now there are natural uh, uh, sweeteners like stevia, uh, which um, don't seem to, um, or at least up to this point, as far as I know, have not been shown to create the same problems. Uh, but um, uh, I can't tolerate stevia because it just gives me a terrible aftertaste. So, but if you can, uh, that that could be uh, um, uh, better than something like aspartame. But um, other things that I have found that can uh, cut the cravings for um, uh, uh, sugar, I mean, uh, sweetened beverages, is to just use uh, um, uh, 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 unsweetened seltzer water, uh, flavored seltzer water, like uh, uh, bubbly uh, or uh, LaCroix or those other uh, flavored seltzer waters that actually don't have any calories, but uh, they give you the kind of fizz um, without the sugar and, and calories. Um, and then uh, I wanna make the point that when you're eating the whole fruit, the sugar that is in whole fruit is fine because as I said before, it comes naturally packaged with fiber, phytonutrients. And um, there's actually, uh, because the sugar that's in um, uh, fruit is fructose or fructose, it tastes uh, uh, more than twice as sweet as table sugar so that you actually have a much smaller amount of sugar, but you still get a, um, um, a, a you know, 
uh, significant taste of sweetness for a much lower sugar load. And that sugar is already packaged with fiber, which slows down the absorption of the sugar. And it, uh, in addition, it has uh, phytonutrients and, and uh, uh, um, antioxidants and so forth. And the same is true when you look at the fat content of things like nuts and avocados that um, uh, uh, the, the fat in whole plant foods uh, are, again, um, packaged with uh, um, phytonutrients and, and, and some fiber, and um, the fat is not oxidized. So it tends, as long as it's not eaten to excess, uh, uh, is not uh, um, unhealthy. Uh, so that is um, what I would say about um, sugar. Uh, all right. Okay. All right, so Dr. Mills, thank you. So we're gonna move from the formal presentation. So everyone, whatever your questions are, um, please put them in the chat and we'll use the last um, amount of time that we have um, tonight to just ask Dr. Mills whatever questions you all have. And so the first question I think Dr. Mills is just a general question around nutrition. Sure. Um, I think some people are a bit sad or depressed right now because they were looking forward to their sugary snack and alcoholic beverage when they got off of this meeting. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not saying I was gonna have an alcoholic beverage because of what happened at the beginning, but you've taken that away from us. And so my question to you is from a doctor's perspective and especially one who promotes whole food, plant-based nutrition, how should people look at food? Because it seems that many people look at food as a form of pleasure and perhaps a form of entertainment. How should we, if you were to like say it in one or two sentences, when we think of food, the way that we should um, look at it is what? That you know, that is an that is an outstanding question. Um, um, oh my God, I, I I'm I'm sitting here having a, a mini mental orgasm because I just love that <laughs> question so much. Uh, but before I answer that question, I want to be clear. I I I, I do not want people to think that I am the food police who, who walks around with, you know, the ruler to slap fun things out of your hands. I'm not saying that we can never have, um, you know, a, a couple of cookies or a piece of birthday cake, or again, you know, a couple of uh, drinks at, at, a, at a party or celebration. Yes, we can. But we just need to be aware of what the issues are associated with those things so that we can, you know, judge um, um, how do we do it. So, um, for instance, the last time I had um, uh, any alcohol was I, I went to, uh, I don't know, a party for a friend and, and, and had a couple of gl uh, glasses of Prosecco. Um, and that was, I don't know, over a month ago. You know, something like that is not a big deal. You know, um, um, you go to a, a party or a wedding, you have a couple, a, a piece of cake or two. Again, not a big deal. The issue is, if every time you come home, you got to have a cocktail or two, and, you know, and you're having a, um, um, a sugary dessert every night with your uh, uh, after dinner, as opposed to, you can have um, like a fruit-based sherbet that is really, you know, more of a whole food as opposed to, you know, something that's made from a lot of sugar so that we can have desserts that are really whole food-based that are not, um, uh, that are keeping in line with the principles that we're learning. So I, I just want to set that aside right now. But the, the, the problem with Western, uh, um, the, uh, the Western relationship to food is that we've been taught to, to view food and eating as some kind of trip to an amusement park, that the primary purpose is to have pleasure. And food is really supposed to be a vehicle for the delivery of nutrients and usable energy to our bodies. 
And so whenever we look at a plate of food, we need to ask ourselves, what nutrients is this uh, food I'm about to ingest going to be delivering to my body? What, uh, um, you know, is the type of energy that I'm going to get from this plate of food? Is it going to build up my tissues or is it going to deplete them of, of, of nutrients? So, um, uh, and, and, you know, to just use a very simple example, if you look at uh, um, a, uh, a salad that is made from, you know, a variety of lettuces, uh, some mushrooms, uh, maybe some uh, um, walnuts and, and a, a nice healthy dressing, uh, some fruit, uh, um, maybe a, a, a whole grain uh, um a uh, dish on the side with some uh, steamed broccoli. And, and I, I'm not saying that that's what you eat because that, that, that's a little boring and I'll even admit that, but I'm just kind of laying up that food versus, you know, some potato chips, cookies, uh, a Coca-Cola um, and French fries. The one meal is going to load your body up with nutrients, fiber, antioxidants, phytochemicals, it's going, you, your body is going to be just, you know, really uh, 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 loaded with the kinds of things you need to ward off um, the ravages of, of living throughout the day versus this other uh, uh, meal that is loaded with empty calories that is going to rob your body of, of nutrients in order to just process all of that uh, uh, grease and sugar and, 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 and so forth. So again, we must think of food as the vehicle for the, the delivery of nutrients, fiber, antioxidants, and phytochemicals to our body. And so that at any meal, we need, we should ask ourselves, what nutrients is this food going to deliver to my body? And it's just kind of like, think of it like inviting people into your house. When somebody comes to your door, one of the things you ask yourself is, should I let this person in my house? And if it's, you know, a contractor who's coming to lay down a new floor in your kitchen, you're like, yeah, this guy, when, by the time this guy leaves my house, my kitchen's going to be beautiful. If it's the local, you know, drunk or crackhead from around the corner, you, you, you're not about to open that door because you know that when that person leaves your house, it's going to be a mess. <laughs> and, and that's the attitude we need to have about our food. <laughs> so I think the answer is do not let the crackhead in no, your house. Absolutely like, not. Exactly. <laughs> I think that sums exactly. it up. <laughs> and and uh, Dr. Mills, um, and you know, I'm asking these questions because there are people on this uh, meeting who are not plant based, and right. they have like one foot in, and there's something sure. that you're going to say that's going to get that other foot over. And so, one thing I want to ask you is about the people who do really well during the week, mm -hmm. and then on Saturday and Sunday, there's an inundating of the body with alcohol and fried sure. food and all of that, and then they go back on Monday and I think that's okay. Um, and the research is coming out that says that's not okay and kind it's of okay. done everything. So can you speak to that person? Sure, it, it, it's, it's, it's like a marriage. And you know, if you are faithful to your spouse Monday through Friday and then you go out home on the weekend at the club, how long is your relationship gonna last? <laughs> and how healthy is your relationship gonna be? It's not. Because it's going to break down and fall apart. And the same thing happens to our bodies. I mean, we cannot abuse ourselves that way. And the, but and this is the most, but this is the most important thing. And I'm glad you asked that question because you know, we always tend to think in terms of, but I like, but Dr. Mills, I can't live without. And my question is, did you have a conversation with your obstetrician when you were born? No, you did not. And my point is that none of us were born liking anything but our mama's milk. Everything we think we like and can't live without, we were taught to like, we learned to like. Now, think back to your first boyfriend or girlfriend. 
that you thought you couldn't live unless you were inhaling the breath they exhaled until they slept with your cousin or your, you know, your neighbor or they stole money from you. And you said to yourself, why am I with this fool who's making me miserable? And just like we learn to kick unhealthy relationships to the curb, we need to learn to kick an unhealthy diet to the curb. And if you found a new relationship and you're in love with that person, you love them and you're happy. And the same thing will happen when we learn to love a diet that is good for us, builds us up, makes us healthy, and um, you don't miss what was not good for you. I'm telling you, I know this for a fact. Because I grew up eating, you know, just about every kind of meat under the sun, thought I couldn't live without it. So I was delivered from it. And I'm telling you, it horrifies me to think that I used to put dead, rotting corpses in my body. Mm -hmm. um, because that's really what we're doing when we're eating dead flesh. We're dining on corpses. And that is as nasty and disgusting internally as it sounds externally. Um, we're not, our body is not supposed to be a graveyard. It's supposed to be uh, a place where we ingest things that are uh, living and, and will build us up and, and fill our body with vitality and health and not, you know, something that's full of necrosis and uh, 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 rot and decay. Excellent. And Dr. Mills, we will be making some t-shirts um, from your quotes uh, when this meeting is over. <laughs> but I just want to say that we have a lot of church women on this meeting and they thought their hoeing days were over, I guess, but now they have heard tonight they were hoeing <laughs> on the weekend. And so they have some things to sit with thanks to you. So that was a very powerful <laughs> way to put it. So um, one more question in that oh, line of and thought. Look, as many as you need. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so when we're talking about plant-based, I think many people um, get stuck on the idea of not eating meat. And so they start eating a lot of crap, so to speak, but it's not meat. And so, but it's not healthy. And so I want you to speak to the idea of that, that it's not just about not eating meat, it's about eating healthy food. Absolutely, that, that is, a, a, again, an excellent, excellent point. And, and that goes back to, the whole idea of a whole food plant-based diet when and 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 this brings up the, this whole idea of because now there are so many uh um options out there you know there's beyond burgers beyond sausage beyond meat there are so many different types of meat alternatives uh and people wonder well are these things healthy how healthy are they da, 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 da. well first of all let me say this there was a um, study done at my old medical school, Stanford University, where they actually compared Beyond Burgers to hamburgers. Uh, and it was a crossover study. Um, oh, gosh, I, I, you know what? I, 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 I can send you that, that the, the, the um, uh, slides later. I, I don't want to go fishing for them now because it may take me a while to find it. But um, actually, you know what? You just give me a minute. Give me a minute, because I think I know exactly where this is, and I just want to show you all this. Uh, come on up. Yeah, here it is. Okay. All right. Let me let me do a little quick screen share. Boom. Boom. All right, so I'm gonna bring this up. Okay, so how do the plant-based meat analogs compare to eating real meat? So number one, when it comes to the environment, again, no comparison. Um, they have a much smaller environmental com uh, uh, um, impact. They take less water, less land, less energy. And this is important because just this week, we've seen how crazy um our weather has been across this country i mean it was snowing in la ladies and gentlemen snowing in la um when i left last uh um thursday when i left dc to come to california 
It was 80 degrees in D.C., 48 degrees when I landed in San Francisco. That is like the opposite of what it should have been. So, I mean, we absolutely are already experiencing the results of climate change. But let's look at the health consequences. So this is a study I was talking about uh, done at Stanford University comparing plant-based meats uh, with red meats, eight-week crossover study, meaning started with two groups. First group ate Beyond Burgers for the first uh, four weeks. The other group ate beef. Uh, at the halfway point, um, they switched. During the period where the groups were eating meat, they had higher levels of trimethylamine oxide, which is a toxic compound that comes from eating meat uh, that has been linked to higher levels of uh, heart disease, um, uh, strokes, osteoporosis, and cancer. Um, um, the plant-based group, by contrast, had lower, uh, uh, level, lower cholesterol levels overall and lower levels of the LDL cholesterol, which is the worst kind that, that uh, promotes uh, um, uh, uh, heart disease. Um, those uh, eating a plant-based diet also lost weight and had lower blood pressure. And then when the groups crossed over, and that is those that were eating meat went to plant-based, those that were plant-based uh, started eating meat, you saw that the, uh, everything reversed. Uh, the people that had been plant-based, their cholesterol went up, they start putting back on weight, their blood pressure went up, and their levels of TMAO uh, went up versus those that had been eating meat that went on the plant-based burger all of those things started to drop and 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 improve. So uh, again, this is the study published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, um, randomized crossover uh, trial um, on the effect of uh, plant-based burgers. So, uh, all right, let me stop to share. So, one, I just want to make the point that these plant-based uh, uh, burgers are healthier in general, but that does not mean they should be the basis of your diet. What I don't want people to do, like when you look at what the average American eats, they have a giant slab of animal tissue with a sprinkling of vegetables uh, around that. That is completely, as my mom would say, bass ackwards, okay? Um, we should always, the vast majority of what we're always eating should be plant foods. And so even when you become plant-based, if you choose to use these meat analogs, they should be a small portion of what you're eating, but the vast majority of what you're eating should be whole unprocessed plant foods. So the bulk of what we're eating should always be um, uh, uh, whole plant foods. And again, and you don't need to include these meat analogs, but if you do, please just make them a small portion of your meal, but make sure that most of what you're eating is uh, um, these uh, uh, unprocessed plant foods. And there's so many really good um, uh, plant-based cookbooks out that teach people how to um, make amazing, delicious uh, 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 meals from whole plants now, you really don't even need these uh, um, meat analogs. You can uh, use them for fun and variety, but you absolutely don't need them. Um, I, I know that you know my friend and chef, and she calls herself a vegetator, Dawn Hilton Williams, who has an amazing cookbook out called uh, Flavor My Plate which has some wonderful and amazing recipes in it. And um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I actually put a call out for people to just on my Facebook page for people to recommend a whole, um, just their favorite uh, plant-based cookbooks. And I'm telling you, got literally hundreds of suggestions. So um, uh, people go to my Facebook page, they can pull that post up and there are just uh, a number, just, just, uh, a whole ton of, of, of cookbooks that are, that are listed. So there are so many different options out there. And um, I, I can tell you that there are so many different things to eat that people will not miss uh, uh, and will not be unhappy that they change their diet. Because again, when something is good and it's satisfying, you're satisfied and you're happy. Um, and you don't miss 
um, something that you went, especially when you realize it was making you sick, it's making you tired, making your joint aches, and making you feel bad. Just like, again, just like you don't miss um, a bad relationship, you will not miss a bad diet, I assure you. And Dr. Mills, um, some people are hearing you, and so they're thinking, okay, I will no longer eat red meat, but they're not connecting what you're saying to chicken or fish. Oh. And so can you speak to chicken, fish, and perhaps eggs as well? Sure. And all of that is animal tissue. And uh, the main thing, the, the, the best thing that, um, 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 would you put my website in the chat? Sure. Dr. Milton Mills Plant Based Nation dot com. So it's Dr. Milton Mills Plant Based Nation dot com. And um, in that chat, um, I have a, um, uh, a lect or in, on my website, I have a lecture on protein. And it talks about why animal protein uh, is so unhealthy for humans. And that includes all animal protein, red meat, so-called white meat, poultry, and fish, and so forth. But again, since people have um, uh, kind of brought up that question, let me quickly um, uh, show the, the, the reasons uh, why I um, uh, 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 um, uh, say this. So, uh, all right, we're gonna go through this really quickly. Let me share screen. Uh, and then again, uh, when they go to the uh, website, they'll get the whole lecture. So why is protein important? Okay. Well, protein is important because proteins are what our bodies are made of. They are, they are building blocks for living bodies. Okay. They make everything from muscles to the receptors in our eyes that allow us to see uh, the uh, 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 um, uh, uh, hemoglobin in our uh, red blood cells that carries uh, oxygen and just on and on and on. Uh, even insulin itself, the hormone, is a protein. So proteins are just amazing uh, 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 biological entities that do just incredible things. Uh, and uh, as I said, um, they are the building blocks for our bodies. Uh, human tissues made of proteins, everything from the clear cornea uh, in, in your eye, the iris muscles that could, uh, relax and contract and allow muscles, I mean, eye, uh, light to pass into the, uh, to the uh, retina, uh, the cartilage in your nose, the hair that makes it for your eyelashes and your skin, all of this made of protein. Well, building a body can be thought of as analogous to building a home. And given that the proteins are your building materials, if you're building a home, the question is, how much building material do you need? Well, that depends on several things. It depends on how big a house you're trying to build and how quickly you, you plan to build that house. So if you are building, you know, a 60 room mansion, you're gonna need a lot of building materials. Or conversely, if you have a 60-man um, building crew, then you need a lot of building materials because you got a lot of workers. On the other hand, if you're building uh, a cabin in the woods by yourself, you don't need somebody bringing you a lot of building materials all at once because you can't use it, okay? So again, you want your building materials delivered to your body at the rate that you can utilize them. That's one of the reasons you see such a difference in the amount of protein that's in cow's milk versus human milk. Human babies grow very slowly, very low protein content. Cows grow very fast. That's why they have five, you know, like more than three and a half times as much protein in cow's milk as human uh, uh, milk does. All right. Next principle. Uh, again, you need to deliver at the rate they're being utilized. Um, so. I just kind of covered that point. If you're growing fast, you want fast delivery. If you're growing slowly, you want things delivered uh, at a more modest rate. Now, this is what's key. 
once the house is built, you don't need a lot of building materials delivered, okay? So adult humans don't need a lot of protein because we've already built our body. We just need enough protein on a day-to-day -day basis to replace worn out proteins and repair any damage that we might have encountered. What happens if even though you've completed your building, you keep bringing in truckloads and truckloads of building materials? Well, you end up um, with what I call um, uh, a biological anomaly. Uh, well, okay. Well, this is just points out that baby birds uh, um, need a lot more uh, protein. And this just shows the difference in cow's milk versus human milk. Uh, all right. I think this is a slide. To, yeah. So if you keep bring, bringing building materials to a completed building, you end up with a pile of rubble because you can't use it. And a pile of rubble, an organic pile of rubble is a tumor. And this is why in Western countries where people eat all of this protein that their bodies can't use, you end up with all these, these tumors. You end up with lipomas. You end up with fibroids. Um, you uh, uh, can end up with fibrocystic disease and, and breast tissue, uh, uh, you know, skin cysts and, and so forth. Uh, and, you know, uh, or you can actually end up with actual cancers. Um, and uh, study after study after study has shown that uh, eating a lot of animal protein will promote the development of cancers in adult humans. And that's why we need to stay away from animal protein. Uh, so it, you know, wrong signals, of course, lead to disaster. So let me ask you, I show people this picture. I say, what is a natural diet for these animals? Everybody says plants. Okay. At what point in their lives do they eat animal protein? 90% of the people say never. But then some people say, oh, wait a minute. When they're babies and they're nursing, their mother's milk is filled with animal protein. And that's exactly right. When they're babies, they're rapidly growing and they're consuming animal protein. But what that means is animal protein is a growth signal to plant-based mammals. And that means that when we as adult humans eat animal protein, it signals our bodies to try and grow. Um, and as a result, they will start growing tumors. Um, and uh, some of those tumors will actually turn into uh, cancers. Um, and uh, uh, that's just, well, I mean, these, these, these other slides kind of go on to, well, let me just show you this, because um, uh, so uh, it, it turns out that animal, how do, you, how do you tell the difference between animal protein and plant protein? Animal proteins tend to have higher levels of what are called essential amino acids. People thought that that meant that they were better for us, but in fact, that's not true uh, because these higher levels of essential amino acids uh, uh, signal growth to our bodies, turns on these genes called mTOR genes, which uh, increase the level of growth hormones and um, have been shown to increase um, uh, uh, cancer development. Um, and let me just skip, I want to skip down here. It increases IGF levels. Uh, IGF, insulin-like growth factor, very common on tumor cells, but, um, and lower in people that eat plants. But th this is the study I was going to. And a very important study that was conducted over 18 years. They showed that people who ate more animal protein had four times as much cancer as people who ate less animal protein. And they had a 75% higher risk of dying prematurely. And so, I mean, 
this is pretty definitive. And, and these results have been replicated in study after study after study. Uh, animal protein is unhealthy for adult human beings. And that's just the bottom line. But uh, I would encourage people to go and uh, to the website and um, look at the, the full um, uh, lecture on protein and it'll give you all of the detail you need. But uh, so animal protein, that includes uh, red meat, poultry, fish, and especially eggs. Uh, eggs have also been shown to be a um, major, major, um, uh, uh, risk factor for, um, uh, prostate cancer for, uh, um, um, let's see, uh, uh, hold on. You know, I, I, it's, it's, I, I have to apologize, but when you guys start asking me questions, I just go into total geek mode. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and, uh, um, so, this is a um, study I did, I mean, a lecture I did for work uh, showing uh, the risk for prostate cancer, okay? So it shows, uh, again, we already know about uh, the casein versus uh, whey, um, but uh, cow's milk has been shown to markedly increase uh, the risk for prostate cancer, as I mentioned before. Um, and uh, doc, in the China study, Dr. Uh, um, Campbell showed that uh, it promoted all stages of cancer development. Uh, that was true for skim milk as well. Um, I'm trying to, let's see. Ah, this is the, what I wanted to show you guys. Study showed, and this is a Harvard study, eating two and a half eggs per week increase the risk of prostate cancer by 81%, okay? Just two and a half per week. Again, because of the animal proteins and the growth stimulants in the egg itself. Because what is an egg? An egg is designed to make a baby bird. So it has growth stimulants in it. And um, um, we should you know, limit or eliminate, preferably eliminate our uh, uh, exposure to it. And I'm telling you that um, I've got um, so many of my adult male friends who have either died from prostate cancer or who are battling it right now uh, that uh, uh, this is something I take very, very, very seriously. And I encourage all of them to eliminate this stuff from their diet because trust me, it is not worth the risk at all. all Dr. Right. Mills, can you, can you speak to what fibroids are and why black women tend to have them more? Sure. So what a fibroid actually is, is um, the wall of the uterus is made up of what are called smooth muscle cells, okay? Um, they're muscle fibers that, um, um, they're different from um, the type of uh, muscle fibers we have in our skeletal muscles, um, uh, but um, they can be very powerful and they, they are normally um, arranged in these uh, very orderly smooth sheets that wrap around the wall of the uterus and, um, you know, at an appropriate time when, um, you know, a woman needs to uh, expel uh, a, a baby or, um, um, you know, uh, actually uh, expel the lining of her uterus, uh, the cells are meant to contract in a coordinated fashion. What a fibroid is, a fibroid is when a smooth muscle cell starts to proliferate and grow in an abnormal fashion, and it forms this kind of tangled ball of, of muscle cells. And so it's a, it's a clump, a clump of muscle cells that kind of disrupts the normal orderly pattern of uh, muscle cells in the, in the uterine wall. And again, because it, it can sort of bulge into the uh, uterine uh, uh, lumen and disrupt the lining, it can cause abnormal bleeding because these muscle cells are kind of disorganized and form this sort of uh, 
uh, twisted mass. Um, they tend to, when they contract, they can be very painful. Um, and one of the reasons that um, uh, I think Black women are uh, more prone to it is because Black women are eating a European style diet, which promotes the development of fibroids. You don't see the same level of fibroids, uh, uh, fibroids in um, African women eating traditional African diets, plant-based diets. You don't. You also don't see um, um, uh, the same um, uh, um, uh, issues with fibroids in women who are plant-based. And then there are women who um, have, who had problems with fibroids and fibrocystic disease who became completely vegan and their problems with the fibroids and the painful menses and all of that resolved. Um, so, um, uh, um, uh, there are uh, a number of websites, um, that, that uh, women can go to. Uh, one is uh, Brenda Sanders. Um, uh, oh God, what is Brenda's? Give, give me one second. I wanna um, try to see if I can pull up Brenda's um, web. You can send it to me after as well. Okay, okay. Yeah, um, um, but she, she, and she has um, uh, information uh, on uh, diet and, and uterine fibroids and how to treat uh, 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 treat them, but again, it it will require um, you know changing the way um, we eat and and uh, reduce eliminating a lot of the fat, especially the animal fat and fried foods and those things that tend to cause the inflammation that will drive the uh, uh, not only the the development of the fibroids but will cause them to uh, um, uh, become more painful and active during uh, hormonal phases. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of questions in the chat about, um, I guess, particular nutrients that people are not going to get. The typical questions that you get from someone who's not plant-based about where are they going to get the iron from, where are they going to get the calcium from? And so the, the <laughs> question I'm asking is, what is your view on supplements um, sure. and things like prebiotics, probiotics? Um, iron, calcium, D3, should people be taking that or can they get all of that from the food? Okay. So the number one, the only thing that people cannot get from a plant-based diet is D3. And that's because D3 is made through sun exposure. Um, if we were all running around naked in the sun, like God intended, we would make all the D3 we needed to make, but we don't want to get arrested. So we don't do that. Uh, and so the fact that our D3 levels are low is an artifact of the societies that we live. And I want to make it clear, everybody's D3 low, even um, people that eat meat, because they don't get enough sun exposure. And um, so taking a D3 supplement is just a requirement of living in modern society. So that's number one, it has nothing to do with our diet. Number two um, is uh, B12. Um, and B12, all B12 is made by bacteria. There's no B12 that is made by either plants or animals. And it is true that most people um, in Western countries get their B12 from eating animals that have eaten bacteria that have made the B12. Um, but um, the reason we can't get it from our environment is because we have destroyed the natural sources of B12 in our environment. We sterilize our water. Um, we excessively wash our food to get rid of all of the soil and, and, and other bacteria that may be on the food that could be making the, the, the B12. And so we've eliminated natural sources of B12 from our food and environment that's why we have to take a B12 supplement. Uh, but again, that is an artifact of how we choose to live. The other nutrients, including calcium and other things, are all abundant in plant foods. It is a grotesque misapprehension that animal foods are either needed for calcium or even good sources of, of calcium. Dairy calcium has never been shown to be protective for uh, um, um, 
a person's bones or preventing uh, fractures. In fact, the Harvard Nurses Health Study showed that the women who drank the most milk were um, had the greatest risk of developing osteoporosis. Worldwide, the countries that consume the most meat and dairy have the highest risk of, uh, or the highest prevalence of osteoporosis, greatest risk of hip fracture, because animal protein leaches calcium from our bodies. And then just to really put this in perspective, antlers are made from solid bone. Uh, an adult male moose has a rack of antlers that weighs 85 pounds. It's made out of solid bone. And the moose grows the antlers in three months eating nothing but green plants. If you take a six foot adult human male remove all of the flesh and skin and muscle from his body and just have a skeleton, his entire skeleton only weighs 25 pounds. And it takes him 18 years to grow that. So my point is that there's plenty of calcium in plant foods. Think about cow's milk. There's plenty of calcium in cow's milk, but cows don't drink milk. They get it from the plants they eat. So the, if people have just been really intentionally misled by the dairy industry, to, to make them think they need uh, dairy foods to get calcium. Plenty of calcium in plant foods. Green leafy plants are loaded with calcium. And so as long as you're eating your spinach, your collards, kale, um, broccoli, cruciferous vegetables, uh, almonds, even beans, you are getting more than enough calcium. You don't have to be worried about that. Um, now, if you want to take supplements, I don't see, um, I, I mean, the, the things that I would insist that people take is 5,000 IUs of D3 every day and uh, one milligram of uh, B12 once a month. That will be more than enough because our body can store B12. But if you want to go beyond that and take a multivitamin or, you know, um, vitamin, some extra vitamin C or something else, that. Uh, will not hurt you and it can possibly help you. And so I would say if you want to do that, feel free to, but you shouldn't feel that you have to because you don't. As long as you're eating a healthy, balanced, whole food, plant-based diet. You know, if you're eating uh, uh, soy delicious ice cream and potato chips, yeah, you better take a supplement. <laughs> okay, so last two questions. Um, and this one, I'm not sure how briefly you can answer it, but what is the gut microbiome for people who are now hearing that term everywhere and how is it connected to our health? Okay, uh, again, awesome question, awesome question. Our gut microbiome are the bacteria that live in our colon, okay? And human beings have a very long colon. Um, and it turns out that the bacteria that live in our colon um, really, and um, by the way, on my website, I have a whole lecture on the microbiome. So people can go there and look at that lecture and get a very thorough discussion of the topic. But the bottom line is that the bacteria are supposed to be, um, um, when we eat a whole food, uh, high fiber diet, the bacteria um, uh, act on the fiber that we eat and break it down into these very important compounds called short chain fatty acids that help lower your cholesterol. They help lower your blood sugar. Um, they uh, help uh, um, increase your um, uh, available energy for your body. And they even manufacture neurotransmitters that, that decrease the risk for depression, anxiety, and, and other uh, mood uh, disorders. So they're really important for our overall health. And when we don't have a healthy microbiome, uh, there, are, uh, the toxin levels in our body are much higher. Um, we again tend to um, be more prone to depression, uh, anxiety, and, and so forth. So, having a healthy microbiome is absolutely essential. So, the question is, does that mean that you have to go out and buy these probiotics all day long? No, 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 you don't. Because what again studies have shown is that when people buy probiotics those probiotics really don't stay in the body very long. The best way to get a healthy microbiome is by eating the types of things that the bacteria feed on. And what is that? Fresh 
fruits and vegetables and whole grains because that fiber in those whole plant foods is what will feed the microbiome and keep it healthy and help keep uh, drive the bad bacteria out of your body and keep your total microbiome working uh, uh, the way it should. Okay, and so last question on Dr. Mills. Many people are here on this meeting are perhaps we would say um, older in age. Mm -hmm. And many of them though have children, grandchildren who they're still feeding all of the things that you are telling them not to eat. And perhaps they've made the decision not to eat it for themselves. There's some questions in the chat about um, when you were talking about dairy and people are saying, this, this, is this why we see perhaps larger breasts in uh, boys and things like that? And so I want you to speak to the idea of the importance of starting early and not perhaps letting children eat what they want while the adult is eating something else. Oh, my God. Yes. It's like, you know what? Um, my, uh, um, I ended up having two of my nephews coming to live with me when they were um, young teenagers that are like 13 and uh, I think 13, 12. And, um, and of course, when they came to live with me, they're like, well, you know, I'm not vegan. And I'm like, okay, well, you don't have a job and I don't buy poison. So <laughs> you're going to eat what I buy, what I provide. Now, having said that, uh, I made sure that the food that I provided for them was delicious and tasty. And I told them, I said, you know, you do what you're supposed to do around the house. You get an allowance and you can take your allowance and you can spend it on what you want to, but you just cannot bring uh, meat in my house. Um, but if you want to go somewhere and order some chicken or something, that's on you. They saved their meat up and bought tennis shoes and, you know, DVDs and went to the movie with their girlfriends. They never spent it on me. My point is that when you provide kids with good, healthy, delicious food, they don't miss the meat. And absolutely, um, you know, our job as parents is not to cater to our children's wishes. If your child came home and said, Mom, um, my friend around the corner is smoking crack and I want to do it. Are you going to let them? You know, you know what I'm saying? Come on. Uh, you want to tell them? No. You know, now I'm not even going to let you smoke a cigarette. So, you know, our job is to do what's best for them, whether they understand it or not, whether they like it or not. And um, eventually they will understand and appreciate it. And that's just the bottom line. Um, and as long as we know that we are providing good, healthy, and again, you know, let's just make sure that we're making sure that it is tasty and, you know, satisfying. I mean, like, you know, some nights I might, you know, survive on rice cakes and uh, hummus, but I would never feed that to, you know, my, my nephews because I'm going to make sure that they have something that's going to, you know, uh, satisfy them. And, and, and uh, um, so I'm not going to, you know, make them like suffer, but um, uh, yeah, no, we got to do what's best for our kids because it, it, the point, you know, I told somebody this the other day um, when I'm talking about food addictions, you know, when we think of people who are addicted to something, uh, we, again, we always talk about the alcoholic, uh, the heroin addict, and uh, the crack addict. But I tell people, you know what the crack addict never does? They never take their children to the crack house. Okay? Whereas we get addicted to all this unhealthy food, and what do we do? We turn around and teach our children the same bad habits. And that's just wrong when we know we got habits that are destroying our own health, why are we gonna do that to our kids? We have an obligation to do what's best for them. Uh, and that's just the bottom line. Excellent, I think that's a wonderful note to end on. And Dr. Mills, where are you in the country? Um, we have people on this meeting from all over, so now they want you to be their doctor. So where <laughs> are you? <laughs> And how so can they find I'm, you? Yeah, I'm located in uh, the D.C. metro area. So, uh, but as I said, right now, I'm actually in Oakland, California, because I came out here to do a um, program at a, a church out here over the weekend. But I travel a lot, um, uh, you know, to, to lecture and, and so forth. So I'm all over the place. But as I said, uh, please uh, go to my website. You can uh, send me messages through the website and... Uh, 
uh, and we can try and, and hook you up with somebody in your area because uh, um, they're plant-based, fortunately and wonderfully, there are plant-based doctors uh, all over the country now. And um, um, there's even a database uh, um, that people can uh, access uh, to help them find someone in their area who can uh, uh, help them uh, uh, transition to, to plant-based plant lifestyle and their online resources that can also uh, uh, help in that regard. Okay. And then um, people are asking what your Facebook page is, but before oh, sure. you give that, you do have to warn them that you're very political. So, <laughs> <laughs> so they're going to see a lot of Trump stuff on there. And so they should know that. But, yes. Yeah, you, you, yes, that that is so true. Although sometimes I think it's kind of fun to let them be surprised, but um, it is um, it is Milton Renee Mills, just Milton R E N E Mills, and my avatar is a suit and a hat with no face because I tell people I'm going incognito. No, you're in the right place because uh, there will definitely be something political there for sure. Well, awesome. Well, Dr. Mills, when you check your email tonight, you'll probably see a hundred from me. You okay. can just delete them. You know, don't worry. Um, just looking for you a little no bit problem. earlier. But um, thank you so much uh, for your time tonight. Um, we were really looking forward to this presentation. When I told everyone yeah. you were coming, we were so excited and you lived up to the hype. Um, well, this was wonderful. I have enjoyed this immensely. And uh um, I, I will I will respond to at least one of your emails with my cell phone to make sure you have it for the future. Great. You know, uh, and if you weren't late, I wouldn't have your cell phone number. So <laughs> see? that and well, we got all this extra time. Yeah. I, I, like everything worked out how it was supposed to. Um, you're gonna be at a conference the weekend of April 2nd in Alabama. And right. I'm gonna be there too. So I'm gonna oh, introduce wonderful. myself. Wonderful, so you're the person. Yes, so that will be awesome. And um, so thank you so much. I'm just going to unmute everyone so we can um give you a formal thank you. And um, hopefully um, this won't be the last time that you join us um no, in the Heart I, Smarts I, program. I would love to come back. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Mills. And everyone, stay on thank after you. Dr. Mills. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Dr. Awesome. Mills. Dr. Dr. Mills. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you for awesome. Thank you. 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 Thank